Revolution Radio of FreedomSlips.com, the number one listener-supported talk radio station, throwing ourselves upon the gears of the machine. Revolution Radio, where information never sleeps. You called down the thunder, well now you got it. Chris, you tell them I'm coming, and hell's coming with me, you hear? Hell's coming with me! Revolution Radio. The Secret Kindergarten is here for the young children of the world. The best program on the radio for kids. Dealing with the most important topics in the whole universe. Fairy tales, music and movement, numbers, plants, animals, fun, colors, insects. Take care and cast your ears out to catch a story from the world of other young things. Reach out, up, under, and over. Sing a song. Talk about feelings. Just remember the magic word. The magic word is no. Step on into the secret kindergarten. Saturdays, 2 p.m. to 3 p.m. Eastern Time, right here on Revolution Radio. We, we, we did not engage in conflict that was out of line with our mission. Is it disloyal? Is it sedition? Is it treason to oppose the hands of tyranny? Never! I will never send troops anywhere on a mission of that kind without telling them that if somebody shoots at them, they can darn well shoot back. I know not what course others may take. But as for me, give me liberty! Oh, give me! A dark cloud is finally lifting across the world as U.S. military intelligence and their global partners are destroying the deep state criminal power structure that has ruled over our planet for hundreds of years. We are free with the God-given rights, and we shall not yield that right to any power on Earth. Hi, I'm Scott McKay. The world is at, and I am your host on The Tipping Point. On Revolution Radio, where every Monday from 8 to 10 p.m. Eastern, we bring you the latest in this ensuing takedown of this global criminal empire. That's an image of strength. You'll get the raw, hard truth here on The Tipping Point. So come join us Mondays, 8 to 10 p.m. Eastern, in Studio B at Revolution.Radio. Thanks for listening while we took that short break here at Revolution Radio, FreedomSlips.com. And now we're going to get back to your host. Calling Dennis. Well, greetings, everybody. I'm here with the open philosopher, Dennis, and he's here somewhere. And it'll be on before too long. I'm Dr. Lenny Time. And uh, I believe we're going to talk about economics today. Although we really need to put Dennis on the call as to what it is we are actually going to talk about. I see some folks in the chat room. Hiya, May Street. Hiya, Pat Rabbit. Hiya, everyone else who seems to be here. This is Revolution oh, Radio. Oh, there he is. Are you hearing me? <laughs> I, was, I am now hearing you. I had a line through the microphone. I was muted on on a thing that I didn't even realize was happening. So well, I've just done, done an intro over the top of you then. <laughs> yeah, not to worry. We're all here. And uh, it's free association. It's it's Revolution Radio. It's all a bit improvised. But we, uh, we are. We can talk about anything we like, actually. We can... Start start with economics and work through to metaphysics. That's usually where we end up. Or start with metaphysics and work towards economics. Anywhere you want to take it. I'm easy. I am in the world where my world, everything is nice and mellow. But I guess the world around us has all sorts of war implementation going on. And I have no idea why, 
because when I go out into the woods and hike around looking for mushrooms, everything seems at peace. Yeah, it would. <laughs> it would, Lenny. <laughs> that might have more to do with the mushrooms in the world, though. Well, I think most of the people in the world are just like mushrooms. They're kept in the dark and shoveled a lot of shit. Yeah, that's, uh, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. The, the mainstream media does that to you. So, yeah, it is It is kind of mushroom season. I don't really do them, but uh, I know a lot of people who do, and they, they get some benefit from it. So I don't really... Uh, object too much to anybody doing anything these days you gotta know what you're doing when you're hunting mushrooms because if you eat the wrong type they're very unforgiving but most of the edible mushrooms that i would be collecting are very obvious as to what they are coral mushrooms chanterelles morels it's not morel season though so i don't not going to find many of that here in the fall But we've been having a couple of light freezes at night here in Northern California. And when that happens, it seems to cause another flush. So it has been a good year. Awesome. Awesome. I'm uh, I'm glad somebody's having a good year. Mine's been a bit complicated and and involving uh, things that stop me from doing stuff. But it's... It's getting there slowly, and we're we're in November, so you'd think by the end of the year I'll get it sorted out. Yeah, I'm having a minor difficulty this morning in that Skype has come up over the uh, chat room, and I can't get to my icons. So I was going to send Pat Rabbit some more carrots, but I can't get to the carrot icon. All right, I might be able to do that for you. At some point, but I'm sure somebody will send him carrots. Everybody should send Pat Rabbit carrots. He's a very good host. Yeah, he is that. He is that. So I was, when I was kind of, I was digging around looking for content for the show, as I do on on a Friday and Saturday, and I've been, I've been kind of going, I went back to being 14 for some reason, so... I've been listening to um, a woman uh, on a channel called The Charismatic Voice, and she's a, a vocal coach. She does she does a kind of analysis, but the analysis she does is is old prog rock records usually. So that's the stuff I was listening to when I was fourteen, and I'm wondering if I can get away with it on uh, on Rev Radio. It is, it is content, but it's got music in it, so I won't be able to post it to Spotify, but I might be able to get away with it on the radio. And I found when I was doing the New Way radio show, I had access to all the music, but that might have been because somebody had steampunk ponied up, but I don't think so. Uh, I just think that the world is a strange place when the people who own the music, don't want it to be heard unless they're paid and would rather have people not hear what music they have. But music of the 60s, 70s, and 80s has a great philosophy to it. And you go deeper into the songs and you find some lyrics that just make sense. Like the Beatles, nothing is real, so there's nothing to get hung about. Yeah, I was uh, I was listening to a a vocal analysis of twenty one twelve, you know the the old Rush concept album, right? Nineteen seventy five, Geddy Lee doing his high falsetto, whatever it is that he does. I don't know what it is that he does. I just love it. I've loved it since I was fourteen years old, and I I used to come in from school every night and put on twenty one twelve and a farewell to Kings. So there was an hour and a half of, of rush before I even did anything else. Every night. Literally for two years. <laughs> yeah, I liked one of their obscure albums called Hemispheres. I used to listen to that. But oh, Hemispheres. I don't... Rush wasn't the highest group on my list. Oh, 
they were very high on my list when I was 14. Not so much now, but uh, I think they've officially they don't exist anymore now since Neil Peart died. So the, the drummer died about five, six years ago, I think, something like that. Maybe more. Oh, okay. They haven't, they haven't made an album since he died, and they haven't toured since he died, as far as I remember. Well, you know, a lot of those old 1970s groups came back together to start touring, and a lot of the musicians have died. And I wonder if it has to do with a last gasp effort to try and inform people. But what can you do? I think everybody dies at the end of a fruitful life. Yeah, that's that's true enough. I mean, I'll... There's, there's obviously there's, there's some point where you've got to stop too. And no, I was listening to uh, some Genesis from their final shows, which were fairly recent, I think, at the O2 Arena in London. And Phil Collins's voice was completely shot. He, he did most of the show in a wheelchair, but he must be 80 if he's a day. So give him credit for getting through a. 40 day tour or whatever it was but he was absolutely shot yeah that makes sense the voices that we recognize from those groups 40 years later just don't sound like the same voice and shouldn't I'm sure my voice has changed in that time yeah and that's why everybody ends up yeah everybody ends up doing like American songbook versions of things or jazz versions of things because the the rock the rock vibe becomes too much when you're 75 years old yeah yeah it does require a lot of energy to produce good rock and roll on stage yeah i mean even even with the help of a a a big sound system and a huge light show you can you can only do so much if you're if you're 80 years old and in a wheelchair. So God love him. I, he did his best, but uh, I had to turn it off. Quite honestly, I couldn't watch it. Yeah, I don't I don't watch much anymore. I listen to a lot of audios, but my attention to being on a screen just isn't there. It doesn't hold me to watch somebody on a screen holding a microphone, singing. No, most of the time I, I've got the, I've just got the laptop in front of me, but it's it's blacked out. It, it switches itself off because I don't do anything with it. And then I just, just listen. But I've I managed to sit on my headphones, so my headphones are hanging on by wire <laughs> on one side. So I'm back to I'm back to having dodgy headphones after having a year of, of reasonable sound. Mm-hmm. Yeah, good stuff music, though. I really do like the genre of rock and roll from the 1970s and 80s and uh, British rock and roll with that. The group I was really into at the time I graduated college was Squeeze. You know, songs like Black Coffee and Bed. Very, very sweet. Yeah, they're a good band, Squeeze. I don't think they exist anymore now, but they used to. I saw them at the the Reading Festival a long time ago. Probably the first Reading Festival I went to, or maybe the second. So that will be, we're talking 40 years ago, nearly. (laughs) Yeah, basically that's when the 80s were, about 40 years ago. Yeah, it's it's a bizarre thing, but I... I, I don't listen. I don't listen to anything from now. I really just don't. I might accidentally catch something if Spotify insists on playing it for me or whatever. But uh, I don't go looking for for new music because I know what I like. Yeah, I I'm not even aware of what new music is anymore. If I want to hear music, I will go to my computer and I won't. I won't put on Spotify or one of the music channels. I have about a hundred different LPs saved in the background of my computer. So I just go to my music area and play whatever I want. 
It was funny, though, because one time I accidentally hooked up onto the Wi-Fi while I was playing music, and it went through my stuff, and it blocked a whole bunch of things. Gotta watch out, those AIs. Right. They just, they're after us. In fact, everything seems like it's after us. When did governance of the people, by the people, for the people, turn into an oligarchy? Oh, I think it might always have been an oligarchy. It was just uh, a very, a very smiley-faced oligarchy at one point, and now it's now it's just just grimacing at us and waving a knife. <laughs> well. It seems to me that when it all falls apart and breaks down, we have to bring it back something different. <coughs> yeah, there'll be a way. There'll be a way to do that. There'll be a way to. There's already like there's enough people on the out on the outside looking in to be able to see what's going on. I think there's there's about. 30% of people can see what's going on now. So uh, we're not far off critical mass. No, the way we do things now makes no sense since all the election districts are based on geography. Wouldn't it make more sense to base them on profession or something like that where different professions representing their own interests come to agreements instead of different rich people taking bribes from corporations come to agreements based on their own interests. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's the same. <laughs> Early it, Alzheimer's. Yeah, it kind of works out the same way with, with, with the British system because you've got the, the Labour Party, which is partly funded by the trade union movement. So they get a lot of... Uh, they used to at least get a lot of uh, mine workers and railway men and, and uh, like anybody anybody who was in or media people and that's they were sponsored by the union so the union would put them forward in different constituencies and then they usually in safe seats they get voted in automatically because there's there's going to be a big majority in a safe seat so that's where people want to be. But in the end, you end up with a spread because the, 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 the conservatives have lawyers and doctors and multimillionaires and, and the Labour Party have all the, all the work and class people. So it balances out in the end. Not here. The Democrats and Republicans make up a big uniparty and it's for the rich people, by the rich people. And if you can't pay them... It, it it just amazes me how people go into Congress promising people normality and then they take the bribes. But I don't think they I think they can't refuse the bribes because if you refuse them, they just elect somebody else the next time by targeting your district. And the districts change by a process yeah, that's, called that's gerrymandering where. They, they calculate how many any votes in a certain place and make it so that it balances about 60-40 to disenfranchise as many people as possible. Yeah, I mean, over here, it's, it's like the safe seats are always where they, if they've got somebody they want to be prime minister in five years' time, they'll put them in, in a safe seat. That's, uh, Tony, Tony Blair was the MP in the, the local area where I, where I grew up. And I knew as soon as he got in, he was going to take us to two wars. I could feel that just by looking at him. I didn't know which wars, but I was right. I knew he'd be prime minister and I knew he'd take us into two wars. Just just by looking at him 10 years before he was even prime minister. Yeah, I think you have to be a warmonger to get into politics. I, I really think the solution to wars is to put the politicians on the front lines. That's absolutely right. There'd be, there'd be half as many and twice as many dead politicians. Which is the only way I know of a good politician. I'm at the point where I don't believe that voting matters, at least in the states here. Everything seems to be rigged, but there, people who 
are going to do things, are going to do things anyway. And the enforcement of law is extremely selective and put for political purposes to shut people up. Yeah, there's, there's an element of that going on over here. A, the, 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 I was, I've been a member of the Labour Party off and on since I was what, about since I was about 25 years old or something like that. I'm not a member at the moment because I can't I can't vote for them at the moment because the guy they've got running the place is is a clearly a military intelligence operative. You can see it just by looking at him, and it turns out he's a warmonger. So I'm not voting for him, and I'm not. I'm not paying any subs for any parties while while they've got a warmonger in charge. Isn't military intelligence an oxymoron? Uh, it could I'm not even be. sure they let soldiers think. Well, it's, yeah, there's a uh, there's a level of, a level above the the level of military that's that's meant to be intelligence that. Uh, Seems to just get us into more trouble than doing nothing. That's a real problem that we have in the world today, is that if you withdraw completely and do nothing, you get steamrolled. But if you participate, you make yourself a target. So the thing to do is to act, but act unilaterally as an individual. And then if enough individuals are acting unilaterally, there's no way governance can keep up with us at all. And really, we shouldn't give any credence to the governance. We shouldn't give any credence to the economic system. Let's get off the euro and the pound and the dollar and figure out a way that we can barter for what we need where the form of governance covers our back and makes people whole when they take a loss on their exchange because exchanges just can't be made equal. Yeah, it's tricky to balance out. But we, as, as we were saying a, a couple of weeks ago or three weeks ago, whenever we were having the, the money laundering conversation, it's all, it's all about a ledger, really. It's about just keeping track of whatever we decide is a transaction. Yeah. And in, in fact, the wealth doesn't even need to be harvested. We can keep all our wealth in trees and houses and what, whatever's out there. The valuation that we always have to be paying more and, and paying more because inflation goes up is created by the banksters who now hold everything. Let's dissolve banking, distribute everything once again, start over, but not within the same sort of system. Let's figure out a way where we can have some sort of meritocracy that looks out for the common good while respecting the individual's right to be an individual. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's really, all it is, is I was thinking about this the other day, and it, it, all it really comes down to is just defining what you mean by a, a transaction and then allocating a, a credit to it. So if we, if we're, talk, we're talking about content on the internet or we're talking about conversations on the internet or whatever, just conversations generally, it's like if a conversation becomes a credit, then a good conversation, conversation becomes two credits a useful conversation becomes three credits and and however you want to score it like that or whatever whatever way you decide in the end to to score it amongst the group yes and different groups can have different score systems and work out some sort of equivalence of exchange but certainly the farmer who's growing chickens and eggs doesn't have as much value in his system as the one that's growing cows and grain, but yet we need the chickens and the eggs, maybe even more than the cows and the grain. Hard to say. Right now, the weather is taking care of grain worldwide, and there will be some major shortages next year from what I'm 
understanding. So I don't know. What do we do when we can't get our daily bread? Oh, it's a tricky thing. But, uh, yeah, I think the the outcome of the, the war in Eastern Europe is going to gonna have an impact on that because a lot of the grain for Europe comes from Ukraine. So there's that to take into account as well. I kind of don't think they're growing much grain this winter, are they? No, exactly. Which means they've been, they've been. It's all going to have to be replaced from from other from grain stores or from other places in the world. If we have the grain stores, and you know, people tend to eat the seed grain, which is not a good thing. Um, even if you're hungry, you need to plant your seed, not eat it. But, you know, things are not what they seem. And I, I, I wonder about the numbers we're given for an inventory on things, how much land actually needs to be in production to feed the people, because it seems to me there's still an awful lot of waste in the system. And part Part of the problem I see is corporate. I think that in the United States, they had a court decision called Citizens United that said that corporations were persons, but they don't have the responsibility of persons. And so you go into a court of law as an individual and you have no standing. Only corporations that buy the judges really get standing and decision-making process is not based on any form of logic. It's based on, can I make money on it? And economics has no logic to it, no matter what Adam Smith said about his invisible hands. Yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting thing, but ultimately we can... If we if we're going to start with a fresh system, then we can we can define our own transactions, de- define our own credit system, and then work it out from there. Yeah, in fact, we can define ten or fifteen different systems and try them on small scale locally, and that way have a choice of system that works ten fifteen years down the road. Yeah, in, and we get we get get to model it on a small scale and then duplicate it. Yeah, in Upper New York State, for a while, the town of Ithaca had Ithaca dollars that the town issued that were supposed to be used for local trade, and it worked for a while, but people who opted out ended up draining the resource, and if the doctor and the lawyer won't take the Ithaca dollars, but the baker will, eventually all the baker has are Ithaca dollars, and the money in the system that would have come from everybody participating gets extracted out by the high-paying, less worthy uh, professions like law and medicine. I'm really not happy with lawyers and doctors these days. I bet you couldn't tell that. I could have probably guessed, Lenny, to be honest with you. I haven't never known you for about five years. I've, I've, I've got more or less the same opinion of the medical people. I don't trust them as far as I can throw them. I, I don't have any real interaction with, with lawyers, thankfully. Yes, and you, you tend to not until they find you with a summons of some sort. And any time I've been issued a summons, it hasn't been good. So I'd rather, I'd rather find ways of negotiating without the law. But you know, everybody is taught that the law is inviolate, and you have to respect it. Now we've got this sort of maritime law where they run courtrooms like ships. And I've been in a courtroom. Judges are head cases. At least the ones I've met. I suppose if you get them out of the robes and sit down and have a conversation over a cup of coffee, they might be different people. But the way a courtroom is run 
is pretty amazing. I w- I got involved, oh, maybe right before I met you, in a place where I was living in a motel that was for indigent people that was being run by a nonprofit. And the locals didn't like it. They said it was a problem for all the drug use and stuff. And it really wasn't. The people who used drugs at the motel were the children of the city leaders who kind of wanted to get rid of the motel. Uh, The whole thing didn't make much sense. But they ended up having a lawsuit. And the city decided it would be a good thing to have everybody who was living at the motel at that point be accountable on the, the suit they were filing for breaking the law. And the judge, they, they had like the 20, 25 residents of this motel have to go an hour plus drive because it was like 75 miles away to get to the court thing, to bring us in the courtroom to say, yes, we lived at the motel. And then we got shipped back home by bus and dropped out of the the soup. And the whole thing was just harassment. And they used the law to harass people who can't afford to pay their blood money and the whole system, the whole system, really, if you look at it, is gangsterism, which in the 1930s, the FBI went after and pushed it underground. And the whole political system is just one big thing of uh, gangsters. Yeah, it absolutely is. Even to the extent that uh, Hillary, Hillary Clinton's dad was a was a. a a, a person who worked for Al Capone, apparently. I don't know how true that is, but I've read that somewhere, or somebody said it on a on a podcast, and it stuck in my head. So there's a direct link between Hillary Clinton and Al Capone. There's so many rumors about what we know and what's actually true that I think most of what we know is not true. And the stories change because they don't really happen in the timeline we're on. They happen in similar timelines of different consciousness. And I've been playing with the thought that the current timeline has people from six or seven different times all running simultaneously, doing different things for different purposes, and that it'll all diverge into individual timelines. And in fact, most people have diverged off this timeline, which is why it's so crazy. It's because the people who are making decisions have already left the timeline and we've got non-player characters who can't think outside the box of what was frozen in them when they left in positions thinking they're powerful. Let's turn on the 5G and see what happens when everybody who took the clot shot goes boof and uh, how many people will actually have left in the world. Do we actually have 8 billion people in the world, do you think? Uh, apparently that's the number at the moment, but I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure. I don't know. I think, I think the, the Earth can sustain however many people you put on it because we'll always find technology or a, an innovative solution to, to a problem eventually. If there's a, if there's a major problem, there's, there's a major solution there, but... Uh, I think they, they, they coincide more often than they don't. It seems to me that the ocean is made up of unlimited molecules of water. But at some point, there's a finite number of molecules of water in the volume of all the oceans. But maybe water at a molecular scale and humans at a human scale are fractals of each other, and every water molecule is running this same narrative that we've got in the world today of uh, 
what is it? The deep state versus the people. Yeah, there's an element of that. There's an element of the the dualistic thing. I try and I try and steer away from the the versus part of that, and it's like the it's like there's a subconscious thing going on where the two sides are are reinforcing each other. It's not two sides. It's one side. It's a uniparty in America. The coin is a whole coin. If you want a different side, it's not heads or tails. It's that little rim with all the notches on it. Yeah, exactly. It's a, it's a, a, a well, what one, it's one system with multiple versions. Yeah, and it's not a valid, fair system. It's a construct that once you reach a position where you know you can do things that other people can't do, you can write your own ticket. But the corruption of the system was based on the corruption of personal values long ago. And if you are a, quote, self-righteous, unquote, type of person, you get slammed by the system at every term because every one of those people working in the system has figured out their little niche of how to make it advantageous to them. I say everyone and each of us. I do not mean every single individual. There are some very upstanding individuals in government who have good morality, but they get tread on because they operate in their own little box and don't go beyond their box because they know they get slammed down hard if they did. Yeah, once once you're inside the system, you've got to you've got to play by the by the rules. <laughs> otherwise, otherwise the the rules will uh, will are designed to to crush you. Yeah, I got involved in politics in the 1990 through the Ross Perot campaigns. And Ross Perot had an actual chance to beat Clinton and Bush in 1992. And the dirty tricks that got pulled took him out of that race. But he pulled in the 20% zone. Could you imagine a third-party candidate in the United States pulling 20 30% in this next election, no matter who they have running? And you know you that don't know. Definitely who shake they things up. Yeah. Sorry to talk over you. It's one of those things where I really think that the magician is going to do some magic, and then the director is going to come and say, "Okay, that's a wrap," and slap everything, and then we wake up the next day and we're all in Star Trek u- uniforms. Asking Scotty to beam us aboard. Yeah, there's already an element of that going on. Uh, it's a it's a compli- complicated wo- woven tapestry of timelines, and but, you can step out of those timelines and do just about anything you want to do outside of the time. But when you do things outside of time, they're for your own edification and experience. They don't really happen inside of time. And, well, I don't know. The Mandela effect now has me at the point where my jaw drops. But if the AI and computer systems that we're using have the ability to change the print in books saw shelves. How do we know anything can be real that we read in a book anymore? And yet I've, I've gone back to the books and noted the changes. Those biblical scholars all like to refer to Isaiah 9 through 11, where they talk about the lion and the lamb sleeping together. But, you know, now it's the wolf and the lamb. And you can look up the passage, and it says wolf and the lamb. But 
how many of us know it was the lion and the lamb? And the only explanation is we're not in the same place. We're in a fractal of it. And it didn't happen exactly the same way, which leads me to believe that we are in iteration now that we're going to be through this same thing again. So taking actions that open possibilities, no matter what, those possibilities are if there's something you would like to see take the right action and if you don't see it in this lifetime well this is getting replayed over and over and over in the same narrative at some scale until we fix what the actual problem is but the fix is coming because there's a block on time that can't be passed where the seers can't see what's coming in the future and I find that ridiculously funny and terribly strange. But then again, this world is both strange and charmed at the same time. And so anything really strange has got to be charmed. Yeah, it makes me, makes me think of a Hawkwind album from 1977 or 78. <laughs> Another one that I used to listen to over and over and over again. It's cool. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, there's a song on there called Quarks, Strangers and Charm yep Quarks are strange and charmed I remember listening to a band called City Boy out of Europe or England and they had an album called The Day the Earth Caught Fire <laughs> it's it's pretty amazing how the stuff back then that seems so weird now has a logic to it. And uh, what just happened in Maui? Oh, we're not supposed to talk about that or we'll be disappeared. Hey, this is Revolution Radio, and we're on board at revolutionradio.org. And right now the station can use some funding and so we as speakers, guests, and talk show hosts really would like to continue on having access to the radio where we can talk about things that other stations don't dare to go those places. But if you're an individual and you're thinking, you're going to come up with something different and somebody's going to have the right thing to say to trigger somebody else that's going to make the cascade of reality change as soon as we find that missing piece of the puzzle that's keeping us from seeing what the picture on the puzzle is. Yeah, that's why they, that's why these conversations are important, Lenny. Even if even if we're talking gibberish for fifteen minutes of, of the hour, we're gonna we're gonna end up somewhere. We always end up somewhere interesting. Yeah, we've had many conversations, and I'm now doing YouTube, and one of the things I want to try and do is bring together diverse people that I know who've never met and have a moderated conversation for an hour on a topic that they each know about differently to be able to hear perspective from opposite sides of the viewpoint so that we can figure out what stuff they've inserted into our knowledge base that's just terribly wrong and keeping us from making things happen. It's like <clears throat> I'm a chemist and I talk to the biologists and chemistry is fundamental in the mechanism of biology because if the chemistry doesn't work, the biology can't really work. But biology we know works, so the chemistry of how biology works has to be something that nature has mastered because most things that we have that are alive continue to propagate themselves throughout what we call time now i've been able to slow my human metabolism down to communicate with trees 
it's one of those things that trees are, are so much larger than humans that they don't even notice that there's a human in the tree for about five to ten minutes of human time. But if you are in contact physically, skin to bark with a tree, eventually that tree will ping your consciousness to ask you what it is you want of them. And so having been out in the woods for long periods of time, I I learned to metabolize slower so that I can communicate with trees. There, the thing is that I don't think the trees have anything that functions like a brain. What they have is they've got water flow that can go throughout the tree and pass the information. So I'm pretty sure that memory, consciousness, and all these things flow from any being that has water in it. And human beings are, what, about 67% water by weight? And so we are large sacks of water. The Earth, planetary oceans make up, what, about 65, 70% of the Earth? So maybe planetary scale is fractal to human scale, which is fractal to water scale. And maybe there's some other scales in there also. But the idea of having fractals is they have to be far enough apart so that they don't influence each other and they come up doing the same thing in different form. And so the image looks the same, even though as you get technically into it, they're different. But then as you go smaller and smaller, everything in the fractal has the encoding of the entire fractal of what's going on at every scale. And so it all leads me to blow my mind and say that the construct of physics, chemistry, biology, and math limits us and that there's something else going on. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 something that, that, that I've, I've done, not regularly, but occasionally in the past. So I, I remember when I was living in Hastings, or just outside of Hastings, there was a a church at the bottom of the hill, and the church in the in the graveyard was a, a yew tree, which was about a thousand years old, I think. And I, I, re, I remember going down there and just, out of respect, just saying hello to the tree. You would. Yeah, I don't. I don't remember having any long conversation. I just went down out of respect because it was the the oldest living thing in the area. So it's, it's just a, a matter of all right, just tipping your hat and, and letting the tree know that I was there, really. Yeah, and the tree at that age probably needs time to just a fix that there's another being there i'm sure they get pinged but again the metabolism of a tree is so much slower than the metabolism of a human and you look in scale and you wonder about bugs at least i wonder about bugs because bugs probably could think like humans but if every bug thought a human was a bug and was their type of bug, you could see the whole bug race being totally different. And uh, I don't know, the movie Starship Trooper this made me really think about bugs in human terms. One of, the <laughs> best, one of the best propaganda movies of all time, right? Yeah, there's a... There's, a, there's always an element of of uh, military propaganda in those things. Well, you know, I get to the point where I've read enough science fiction to have seen the plots of things that are going on in the current reality. So I wonder if the writers of crypto fiction now, like Neil Stevenson, are creating the future reality that we're going to step into. 
mean, really, doesn't what's going on now in the world remind you of Blade Runner? Oh, yeah, it's uh, it's definitely going in the Blade Runner Robocop direction, that's for sure. Yeah, and so if those movies hadn't been made, maybe we wouldn't be where we are right now. But those movies are all based on books that were written in the 50s. And in fact, we've got a way of recycling material now that most of the movies are third generation garbage based on second generation garbage written when we were growing up based on first generation garbage that was written after right after World War II. But something changed in the world there that World War II ushered in the modern age and they stopped telling us what was real and let us go off in a different direction by teaching us unreality. And it had to be deliberate, but I'd really love to go back in time and talk with H.G. Wells or Walter Russell or James Clerk Maxwell and get a download from that individual about how they perceived the world at that time. Was there an ether or was there... It was before they came up with the idea of molecules and all that. But isn't it funny how chemistry took off in the 1920s? And one of the famous people was Marie Curie or Mercury. And (laughs) everything goes back into astrology and comes back to the Beatles. Nothing is real, so there's nothing to get hung about. Yeah, I've got this this theory that I when I was a, a child when I was a child I used to watch science fiction movies on a Monday evening. The BBC used to show uh, old fifties science fiction and six sixty science fiction, Forbidden Planet, and uh, them okay. and the Day of the Earth stood still. Those sorts of movies. Okay. And I, I think I internalised all of them. And I've just been carrying around a whole series of science fiction scenarios for my whole life, waiting for the show outside. Yeah. Yeah, the blob with Steve McQueen, or They Live. I think think the reality is that we'll have aliens come out in reality within the next five years because they built us up to it. I just want to... Go ahead. Yeah, I think I think we're well. Well, if if we're externalizing a 1950s science fiction movie, I'm just hoping it's not Invasion of the Body Snatchers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it it is humorous to me to follow the lines of thinking from old movies, television shows, music albums, and such into the inverted reality that we have now from the 60s and 70s when we grew up. But my guess is that children growing up now will have that same experience of inverted reality in the 2070s and 2080s because because everything seems to be a yin and the yang and go back and forth. Yeah, there's definitely a cycle involved. Lenny, we're coming up to the end of the show. Is there any anywhere you want to point people where you're doing articles and such like? Yeah, I'm doing articles as the Mad Doctor Time on Minds.com, and I'm now starting to put out videos on uh, YouTube as Dr. Lenny Time. And so those are the two places where people might be able to find me or on Revolution Radio chatting with Dennis or Mona or some other host. Awesome. Awesome. So that's 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 where the conversation kind of wraps up. We've got a couple of minutes, but uh, I'll tell you where I am online as well. I'm, I'm Occasionally on Podbean, not as often as I used to be. Um, I've got, I've got. Mystery said the the maybe 
a, a two hour show coming up in the chat when I first got here and I am actually thinking about a two hour show coincidentally uh, I don't know where exactly it'll happen one one day during the week actually there's only one slot that's got a two hour slot that I want on Studio A so I, I know where it'll be I just haven't claimed it yet <laughs> I'll, I'll leave it for a couple of weeks and see how I feel um, yeah so that, that'll be coming up because I'm I'm more likely to actually generate content if, I'm, if I've got a time slot booked I've discovered that if I don't have a time slot, I don't do the content. So that's the only way I can do it. Uh, yeah, that's pretty much it for this week. Uh, Rev Radio, as Lenny said earlier on, needs your help if you can do it. And if you go to revolution.radio, you'll find a, a place to make a donation or to set up a, a monthly Patreon contribution, whatever you can afford. If you can't afford to do a a financial contribution, just come down and say hello in the chat room and uh, contribute to the, the shows that way. All right, thanks for coming on, Lenny. I appreciate it. I know it was short notice, but uh, it's been good. Actually, it wasn't short notice because we had talked three weeks ago about talking about economics, but then there were the two parts of the uh, New Hampshire Journal of Corruption that yeah. had to be played. Right. Yeah, so it was organized, but it wasn't organized in my head as much as it should have been, probably. But we get there in the end. If you end up having a two-hour show, I would volunteer to be a regular contributor, and we'll see how things work. I really think it's important that Revolution Radio is cross-platformed, because having access to the radio is important, but other platforms are being invented these days. Yeah, I, I it's, it's important to have that. So you, you, Listening to Revolution Radio. Mountain High Time, two hours of an organization to the madness, discussing the ever changing dynamics of being both physically and mentally prepared for a plethora of possible outcomes to our future and present. A look into the latest technologies, new scientific discoveries, and how they might be used in connection to the human domain and controlling it, ancient cultures and places. Be warned. This is an opinionated look through headlines. Guests that are not afraid to question the narrative. A little bit of crazy ramblings of a stoner conspiracy factus that pushes constitutional concepts. The place and the time are the same, another dimension we call mountain high time. Saturdays, 8 p.m. Eastern Time, 6 p.m. Mountain High Time, right here on Revolution.Radio, where information never sleeps and truth breaks the spell. I am Bill Johnson. Some consider my efforts to be an underground law school. I am not an attorney, and I do not give legal advice. I teach. That's lawful and legal. Consider yourself served. You are to appear Friday evenings, 8 p.m. Eastern, Studio A. My forte? Foreclosure and contract law. Grab your legal pad and pen, learn a broad spectrum of law spanning administrative, criminal, family, tort, and federal law. Fools and losers cling to old cases. I dissect and comment on the latest rulings that control the courts. Don't be a loser. And if you don't appear, you will be held in contempt. Are you interested in the paranormal? 